we'll, we'll I'm talk. just uh, I'm sharing the link here with some uh, some of my folks so we can get out to as many uh, hopefully new viewers as possible. Yeah, that'd be great. I appreciate it. Yeah, always, man, always. Matheny, I was saying Matheny. You it's when Matheny. did you uh, when did you figure out the correct pronunciation? Well, I listen now, to enough podcasts now that you're introducing yourself. I'm not. It's not Matheny. It's Matheny. <laughs> it is. It is Matheny. And I'll I'll tell you what. Uh, and one of the greatest things in life has been Mike Matheny of the uh, St. Louis Cardinals and Milwaukee Brewers fame is the fact that people know who he is. There's also Pat Matheny of the Pat Matheny Fusion Group. We spell our names differently, but believe it or not, uh, are distantly related, although his musical talent did not rub off on me. But uh, more and more, you know, people are pronouncing it correctly. But I always, I, it does me so proud when people say my name correctly, because since I was a kid, they look at, what the hell is this? Matheny? Matheny? Matheny. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, brother. Uh, just for my listeners and viewers who don't know who you are, you have pretty good prominence now, especially on Twitter. You're getting good uh, reaction and following there. Just a, a brief introduction or take as long as you need to kind of tell everyone who you are, where you came from, and how'd you get to this point, man? Well, uh, nice to see everybody here. My name is Eric Matheny. I'm a criminal defense attorney in South Florida. I live in Broward County, just outside of Fort Lauderdale. I've been here in Florida since 2004. Uh, went to Arizona State University, go Sun Devils. And before that, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, a little suburb uh, with its own city called Calabasas. Unfortunately, I think you've probably heard of it being a celebrity haven. It wasn't like that when I was a kid. Uh, I have a podcast with my co-host and friend, Bob Dunlap. We do Bob and Eric Save America, formerly known as Weekly Wrap-Up with Bob and Eric. We cover a host of issues, really everything political and, and certainly conservative leaning. Uh, and then just otherwise, you know, we have a you know, nice Twitter following and uh, just trying to get the truth out there and trying to win hearts and minds. And what, what do you find that you're working hardest on as far as topics? Uh, one of my favorite questions, you can answer this now or later, um, it usually permeates most of the conversation anyways. And I asked um, Savannah Hernandez this question the other day, and I've asked other people, and she chose to answer it from the standpoint of what do you think the top issues are today? But the way I ask the question is, what do you think the top conversations are that we're having or having badly or not having at all? that you think are most important as far as moving forward? I mean, these are some strange times. I want your thoughts on how we come back from the pendulum swinging so far left. I'm a former lefty. I'm a seven or eight time Green Party candidate. So I was oh, wow. never running as a, as a candidate that ran to win. I was running to change people's minds on proportional representation. It doesn't work so well in the States, but this idea that in Canada with five political parties, you can be elected with a majority mandate with, you know, 37% of the popular vote. So I appreciate your, your, your take on what do you find the most important issues are today or the conversations that we're having or having badly that we need to really ramp up for the sake of humanity moving forward type thing. Well, one of the things that we focus on on our show um, is we try to focus more on social commentary and culture, because if you focus on the politics, you're not looking at the problem in an aggregate fashion. Politics is downhill from culture. Culture sets the tone for everything, and politics is a reflection of that. So you have to look at questions. You have to look at problems from the standpoint of why are we doing what we're doing culturally? What makes us think the way we're thinking? What is making us act this way? Not just looking at it from political issues. And I come from a political science background. That's what my, my degree is in, uh, undergraduate degree. Uh, and, and, you know, I've, I've studied all, the, all of them, uh, including Karl Marx, who, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing his theories kind of being interwoven into politics today. But you can't look at it like taxes or look at it at immigration. Look at the culture and look at the issues that are culturally creating the politics. And that's a whole broader conversation. And I think that's where we get to it. We're not in a debate between Trump and Biden. We're in a debate between generally two groups of people who hate each other and can't share the same space. And how did we get that way? It wasn't because of an election. This has been a long time coming. And what's created that animosity? Those are the questions we have to be asking. And so what do you find yourself drawn to as far as the top issues go? Well, I think we have to look at uh, 
demographic shifts. We have to look at cultural shifts. We have to look at generational shifts. You know, I, I am kind of in an odd position generationally because I'm uh, on the cusp of Gen X and millennial. So I see both. And I see maybe a couple of years into my generation, maybe into the late 1980s, where there was a drastic shift in the way kids were parented. Uh, and where parenting went from authority figure to I want to be your friend. It went from I want to help you succeed and I want to motivate you to I want to plow every obstacle out of your way. Uh, I saw that. I saw that firsthand. I saw that growing up. And I think maybe, you know, Bill O'Reilly was probably one of the first prominent uh, social commentators to talk about this. And he was talking about it back in the mid 2000s that this, you know, the teenage kids we're giving trophies to now who haven't earned them, this is going to have a problem in the future. And we're seeing that now. Um, one of my dear friends, and she's fantastic on Twitter, Lauren Cooley, who I'm going to be hopefully seeing tomorrow night. Uh, what she has said a couple of years ago, she's quite a bit younger than me. And she said, what you're seeing on college campuses right now, and that was about 2013, 2014 with safe spaces and microaggressions. Like you're going to see this in the mainstream, you're going to see this in the world because these are people that are not learning how to cope and they're not going to graduate and become adults. They are being formed this way. And her prophecy, unfortunately, became true. So I think that we have to look back at how we parent our kids. And, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of your show, the pendulum swinging back. I believe the pendulum is going to swing back. I think it's going to swing back in a big way. And I think we're going to hopefully have a return to it doesn't even necessarily have to be conservative or liberal, just, you know, common values, principles that made us great. How about, how about, let's start with competition. Let's start with competition. I, why don't we breed competition in our kids? Why don't we say, hey, play to win. Hey, you want to be great? This is what you have to do. Let them fail. Let them fall off the bike. And said, we're so afraid, and certainly in years past, we've been so afraid to let our kids fail. Think about yourself. Think about your life and the greatest lessons were not from your successes. They were from your failures. I agree. And I think that fatherlessness is the, the root of most of these issues that we face today. We took uh, the man that stood beside the, his son in the field, and there was a certain food that was exchanged just by standing beside your father. Even if he didn't physically speak to you, you were getting some nourishment. And then we put him in the plant you know, when the industrial age came and then the father came home for eight, from eight or 10 or 12 hours of hard labor, impatient, you know, at his wits end and, and not really a father. He was, he was pissed off and tired when he came home. And I think we've been seeing that for a long time. You know, I look at these Antifa punks and yeah, there's an idea that these kids have never failed. They've never been given discipline. They've never been spanked. Uh, you know, disciplined in any manner. I know spanking isn't probably the most acceptable thing for your kids, but we all got it when we were kids. We, uh, hey, I had a healthy fear of my father. When the lazy, when you heard the lazy boy collapse, he was getting up. We all ran. We knew there was trouble. Like, and I don't think you see that anymore. Uh, I think there might be an impact facing us now that we've taken mom out of the house and put her in into the workforce. You know, it, it hasn't. We haven't had the time to see the impact of it yet, but I think there's a there's a there's a bad impact that's around the corner possibly for that. And so I keep looking back and going, you know what? We really created a mess, especially in the states in the '60s with welfare, with the idea that you want welfare, no problem. You just can't have the father in the house. And now I've heard you mention this many times on your podcast. You know, I, I've heard upwards of 80% of black families don't have a father in the home. Well, what the hell do we think is going to happen if you don't have two parents? Like this idea that, you know, and I heard you talk about Black Lives Matter wanting to destroy the nuclear family. Yeah, the socialism, the, there's so much undercurrent under what, it's not just about black lives. This is about a Marxist theology that they're trying to implement. And um, wow, I, I, I don't know how we recover from it, Eric. I really don't see how. You can go so far left to the point where boys can, can become girls. Your gender is whatever you think it is. And then you say, you know, politics is down, downstream from culture. I totally get that. I agree with you. The idea that politics is actually falling in line to some of these narratives and protecting children, you know, when they're three years old and they say, Daddy, I want to be a girl. Like, if you don't take him immediately to the doctor and begin transition, you could lose your kids. Like, I just don't see how we swing back 
from something so extreme in the left? Well, I'm glad you mentioned one thing. And, um, you know, a, a race aside, um, the fact of the matter is the, the role of the male in society has been diminished. And you can attribute that to feminism. You can attribute that to the left. You can attribute that to all of the movements that diminished the role of the man in the family. Uh, that's been under attack for a long time. That predates my existence. And more and more today, the feminization of the modern man, the beta male, the cuck, the alpha male is seen as a bully and toxic masculinity. Well, guess what? If there weren't toxic masculinity, we would be speaking German right now. Toxic masculinity has saved civilization. So to, and I use the phrase toxic tongue in cheek, but toxic- yeah, It's more in, traditional it's masculinity, I think. Traditional masculinity that men should be men. And I think women in the workforce has been fine, but think about what that did. That took the woman out of the household in the role that God intended, and that is as a mother. Look, men are hunter-gatherers, warriors. That is what we were built to do. Women are nurturers and mothers. Now, does that mean women are less than men? Does that mean they can't work, they can't accomplish? Not at all, but there's an order to things. There is a biological, scientific, God-ordained order to things that liberalism in the last 50, 60 years has completely unearthed. And it's not working for us. The fact that liberals and, and culture, they're so much better at culture than conservatives are because conservatives, I don't know if it's the Bible. I don't know if it's the whole turn the other cheek thing. I don't know why we are uh, not as assertive or aggressive as we should be. Liberals are very aggressive in the way they get a foothold in culture. They've done it with entertainment. They've done it with big tech and they've done it with education. And what they're masterful at is they can turn the burden onto anybody. And they say, this is the way to think. And if you question it, you're a racist. And you think, well, I don't want to be a racist. Well, I don't want to be a sexist or a bigot. Oh, okay. Well, it's easier to go along with it. I was talking, um, I was on the, the Flock Up podcast this past week and we were talking about uh, these companies giving money to BLM. And these aren't contributions. This is shakedown money. This is money that they're given to BLM in, in the event that something should happen and they should be deemed racist. They could come back and go, well, hey, wait a minute. We gave you guys a billion dollars. So it, when we talk about politics and culture, the left has done a masterful job at inserting themselves in culture. And conservatives, if we want to take this country back, it's not going to be at the ballot box. We have to take the culture back. You said a whole lot there, my brother. I appreciate your thoughts on it. Um, what What are you seeing? Uh, you know, for me, censorship, number one. You know, don't screw with my speech. That's always been number one. And I, I mentioned to you, I don't know if we were live before, but I'm a seven or eight time Green Party guy. I've never ran for the Green Party with the idea that I thought I would actually be elected. It was you know, to teach, you know, with electoral reform, proportional representation, we have things like a carbon fee and dividend, which is basically wealth redistribution, but it taxes bad things and incentivizes. Like, don't tax people when they go to work, tax people when they buy dirty things. So censorship has become one of my main things, free speech. And as a former lefty, I started being pulled to the center and then a little bit more right because the left has gone so far left and we, we spoke about some of the you know the ideological possession of of the ideas of boys can become girls or 75 genders and all that kind of stuff but for me the left used to stand for free speech <laughs> it used to stand, you know legalization of marijuana that was all the left and you know i think jordan peterson i learned a lot from him uh as far as the personality types I went on this search to try and figure out why the left and right was so divided and so acrimoniously at each other and, and kind of like men and women too. And the more I dug into this, I, I came to learn that I think I was mistaken with the narrative that I, the lie that I created in my head was we're, mo we're not more divided than we've ever been. We're not at each other's throats more than we ever been. It seems that way because the, the, the distribute that you know the tail end of the distribution, not the fat part in the bell curve. The you know the the whack jobs on the extremes have the loudest voice, and they've even considered convinced a guy like me 
that they speak for the majority and really they don't, the silent majority, the majority middle, the moderate middle that doesn't really do anything as far as speaking out or being radical or having extreme positions. Uh, I hope to see them mobilized a little bit more, but the left just com completely abandoned all the positions that I was in favor for. You know, I'm kind of like Dave Rubin from the standpoint of, I didn't leave the left. The left ran away from me and they went so far left. So number one for me is free speech. I, I don't understand the, cons well, I want your take on what's happened to the liberal media today. Um, guns, don't mess with my guns. You know, I'm a Canadian. We have lots of guns. I think most reasonable people will agree more gun laws don't make for a safer community. And then I think we got a religious question that we need to hash out, whether it's with the Jews or with the Muslims or the Christians or all three of them. Like, we, you know, one group can't be, you know, wishing for the destruction and actively working for the destruction of all else and think that we're going to get away with it, you know? Well, uh, those are three, you know, primary constitutional tenets, the freedom of speech, the freedom uh, to bear arms and obviously, you know, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Uh, and in Canada, obviously, I mean, not quite the same, but, but similar. I mean, we're all modeled after the, the English uh, system. So I think when it comes to, to free speech and, and especially online, what I was saying earlier is liberals have done a masterful job of gaining a foothold in culture and big tech is a big part of that. So when we see the topics that trend on social media, when we see the content that is pushed forward to the top of your feed that is given to you more prominently and other voices are silenced. You know, that's a handful of far left ideologues who are working at Twitter and Facebook and, and whatever platform who are pushing that out there. The mainstream media as well is an arm of liberalism. And these are footholds that liberals have gained in the culture, which is why you can have an insignificant percentage of people and make it seem like that's the way the majority is. You could take the 11 most pissed off people on Twitter and think, oh my God, that's how the majority feels. The bottom line is this, and as active as we are in social media and as glued as we are to mainstream news and really try not to be, you have to look beyond it because the mainstream media and Twitter and Facebook and social media are horrible barometers for the state of actual culture. You wanna know the state of culture, you wanna put your finger on the pulse, Turn off your computer, put your phone down, go outside. Go, go to the store, go out and about. How do you interact with people? How do you respond when people are interacting with you? How do we deal with people in our day-to-day -day lives? It's not like Twitter. Twitter. The problem with Twitter is Twitter is the worst and best of humanity all at once. The worst of humanity being the anonymity of the internet. So take the id, take the part of your brain that has no filter, you know, you think of something you want to say, but you don't say it because there's that filter. You remove that filter when you go on, on Twitter. Look at the responses you get. You, I could go on Twitter in the morning and say, hey, good morning to everybody. Screw you, you privileged white male. It's not a good morning for me and people of color. It may be a good morning for you. Would you ever talk to someone like that face to face? If I walk down the street and I see my neighbor, even if my neighbor has a Biden sign in their front yard and I have a Trump sign, we're still going to say hi and be cordial to each other. So the way we act on social media, and I could go off on how social media has contributed to this decay in society, uh, I think that's, it's just a poor barometer. As far as guns go, I think the gun argument is failing just on its own, and you really don't hear the left ramping it up as much uh, in light of the civil unrest, the mass civil unrest we're seeing in the United States. We realize now more than ever that having a Second Amendment is important. I think as we... Um, are treading into some very dangerous and uncharted, uncharted in our lifetime. But I've never seen our country in the position we are, are in. And as far as religion, my, my position on religion is this. It's all based on faith. It's what you believe. Do any of us conclusively know like which faith is right and what happens after we die? No, none of us know. That's what faith is. It's a belief. So is your belief any better or different than anyone else's? No. Mind your own business. Keep your religion to yourself and don't impose your views on anyone else. God bless you. I said the same thing. I, you know, I grew up that way. My parents wouldn't even tell each other who they voted for. Seriously. Oh, wow. Like it was that private. And I kind of feel the same way about religion. You know, I, I've got a pretty solid religion. I got, you know, my church and I've grown in faith since 
over the last 10 years, I would say, since I stopped being Catholic and found a church that was actually cool. You know, I run video director there. It's, I look after the kids. It's awesome. But this idea, like, I'm not trying to convert anyone. I, I take people to church because it's, I call it rock and roll pretty church. It's, it's actually fun. It's a good experience. And uh, because I'm so involved in the assisting part of it, I seem to be talking a little bit more of it, but I'm not looking to, you know, make everyone Christian type of thing. So this idea is that, you know, you, keep it to yourself, shut your mouth. Your God is your business. And it, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, nobody really cares who you, who you worship. And if they do, I mean, that's somebody you, you should be spending less time with, I think. No, I agree. And I mean, if you really want to be a constitutionalist, you really want to be um, true to the founding fathers and the founding documents. You know, Benjamin Franklin was a proponent of mosques being built in the United States, of Jewish temples being built. George Washington was honored by one of the first Jewish temples in the United States. He wasn't a Jew. Uh, Religious freedom is a tenet of of what it means to be an American, irrespective of what that religion may be. And religion, look, your, your relationship with the God of your choosing, and it is the God of your choosing, uh, that's a very deeply personal thing. And you can be part of a religious community and talk to people and anyone who wants to listen, but to put one religion over another, I mean, it's, it's so deeply personal. Um, I mean, you look at religion, religion is uh, organized. Religion has created some of, you know, it's marked upward mobility of mankind. I mean, people created these inventions because they wanted to be closer to God. They wanted to see the stars, to see heaven. So they invent a telescope. I mean, it's really marked the upward surge of humanity, but we've also done terrible things to each other in the name of our chosen gods. So uh, keep it to yourself. I, I think it's a personal thing. And I think we'd have a lot less strife in the world if everyone just, you know, minded their own business. There's something to be said. There's a great comfort in minding your own business. Yeah. That's why they call it personal issues because you keep them to yourself. Brother, yep. you're, you're, a, you're a lawyer, so a criminal defense lawyer, I believe. Yes, sir. Um, uh, how, is your, how has the cancel culture affected you, if any? Do you find yourself self-censoring? We talked about, you know, the filter comes off on Twitter a little bit. Hey, I, I would say a lot more things on Twitter if I could release that filter, but I don't really want to pay the price for it. I've been fired. I've been canceled. I'm, I'm sure there's still more room for me to be canceled further. They could probably cancel my Patreon. I should probably get out there anyways, but my PayPal or what, whatever the, you know, Uber, you know, I haven't been canceled from everything. So there's room for me to go if I continue to, what I just see is speaking truth. Uh, in some cases, it's just my opinion. It's not truth. But a lot of the times, you know, I've cemented my opinions on, on facts that I just, I won't move from. I'm kind of still on the fence with capital punishment because I used to say, you know what? Kill the child rapists. Get rid of them. There's no hope for them. Now I'm like, I don't know, man. If, 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 if another man has the right to take a man's life, I, I, I'm not sure if I believe in that. But I backed away from abortion. I used to, you know, champion my body, my choice. But, you know, you know, you know it only took me a couple, I watched a couple of insightful debates on when does life start? That's pretty simple. And this idea that, you know, I think it was Crowder went into a Planned Parenthood with a hidden camera and there was a woman there nine months pregnant going for an abortion. Now, the, 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 we've learned later, I think, that he, he believes that that woman actually didn't go through with it. She had two, two kids already. She was married and the husband didn't want her to have the abortion. And I was just, how, how have we, we've, We've normalized perversion, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, this yeah. idea that you can, you know, just being a, a moderate, I would say, you know, let's, let's end the abortions after six months. We could even probably go to three months. I think even the, the most radical, my body, my choice feminist would say, yeah, no, after six months is not cool. But, you know, we've got Northam in Virginia. Is it West Virginia? That, you know, no, this Vir- idea. He, Virginia. Yeah, saying that, you know, what happens if the baby survives an abortion? Well, we'll keep it comfortable and we'll decide what to do after. What? Like, the, he, didn't even, he didn't even retract that. This is, we've actually normalized perversion to the point where this is, we believe that my body, my choice right up till crowning is just, for me, I can't, I can't wrap my head around it. To touch on your point about uh, normalizing perversion, yes. Yes, we have, and that, again, it all boils down to culture. 
reality TV and social media, that one-two punch has been, an, that has decayed culture so much uh, that the profound effects of which we are seeing now, and I think we're going to see onto the future. When we showed people, young impressionable people, uh, what you could do, that talent, ability was not necessary to become famous, that all you need to do is be willing to make a fool of yourself or to whore yourself out and to sexualize yourself, whatever it takes. Uh, blame the Kardashian family. I mean, the, there's some blame to be spread all around. I think certainly reality TV, social media, obviously. Um, teaching people that affirmation that is needed, you know, what you need to do for attention, that retweets and likes are more important than character and who you are and saying the right thing. And that's where the idea of virtue signaling comes in. And, and certainly with the left, uh, I saw a comic strip the other day that was so telling. It was two guys walking down the street past a homeless man who was holding up a you know, will work for food sign. And the two guys are looking down at their phones. and They're going, oh, wow, that tweet I did about helping the homeless just got 19,000 retweets. And they're just walking by a homeless person, which they call it, they call it slacktivism. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, go on Facebook or go on Twitter. Hey, we should support this cause, but nobody's actually doing anything for the cause. So I think that's one thing. Normalizing perversion. Yes, uh, the left has got that strong foothold in culture. And again, they turn it around on us and tell us that we're wrong for not thinking the way we are. Uh, this, you know, uh, the drag queen story hours and the, you know, children can choose their gender. And if, if we had any gumption whatsoever, we would have put our foot down a long time ago and said, no, that's not okay. But we... The problem is, I mean, sometimes we play too nice and, and that has worked to our detriment. As far as cancel culture goes, like, how, has it affected me personally? I'm self-employed. So, I mean, who are you going to talk to? Like the boss? You're, you're talking to the boss. Um, if I worked for a traditional employer, if I was still a government employee, I, I certainly wouldn't be out in the open. I used to be a prosecutor. I got out of that racket really quickly because government employment sucks. Um, so I've been working for myself for 11, 12 years, you know, every once in a while, you'll get some liberal trolls on, on Twitter who go like, Oh, wouldn't it be terrible if the Florida bar found out about what you said? I'm like, you know, what are you going to do? Knock on wood. You know, no one's ever come after me too hard. And, um, the bottom line is that like, you know, when you get offline and you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, we have a lot more in common than you think. You sit down and talk to people, even liberals, you know, they'll tell you like, Oh yeah, you know, partial birth abortion. No, I'm, I'm opposed to that. I think there should be limit, maybe cap it at six months. I've had immigration talks with liberals and they, they agree like, yeah, yo, we shouldn't be letting in all these illegal immigrants. They're taking the jobs away from disenfranchised communities. You just got to get out of the echo chamber. That's the thing. Mm. Human beings are tribal creatures and you like when people agree with you because it makes you feel like you're part of a community. That goes back to our caveman days. We're stronger together. We have to have each other to survive. And now we're in a culture of ideas and people who think the way you do, they're part of your tribe. So uh, social media just reinforces that. Amen to that, man. So yeah, I'm glad to hear that your cancel culture hasn't come for you yet. But um, do you find yourself censoring yourself on any topics? Is there anything that you won't go near or any points that you try not to make just because like, for instance, for me, I, I've got a pretty decent following on Facebook. But a lot more people know me out there. And so when their criticism comes, it's a little bit more personal. I think it affects me a little bit more than on Twitter, where, I mean, MAGA built my hot rod after 2000 on the account. I'm, I'm just approaching 10 now. And it, I find it strange because when I was a lefty, when I was a Green Party guy, I was a good candidate. And I, I'm good on stage and I know my stuff. And the other candidates some, often were first timers. So they would come up and they didn't know I'd been there four or five times already and been practicing at this. The left loved me when I was a Green Party guy. And the conservatives were respectful. They would, take, they would go out for beers with me afterwards, more so than the left even. And then as I came center right, and I, you know, I've, I've really locked into free speech and guns and abortion as like my key topics, the right obviously is pleased. The left wants nothing to do with me. They write, they write me Jeer John notes on the way out of Facebook. You used to be cool and funny and insightful and intelligent. What happened to you? No, I'm still all those things. I just don't agree with your political ideology. And now I'm a monster. So this idea, the, the tolerant left, man, 
I've learned a big lesson that your friends aren't your friends when you stop believing what they believe. Uh, I mean, your good friends are with you anyways. They don't care. They, they, in fact, they won't even, politics doesn't even come up with your good friends a lot of the times. But this idea, you know, once I moved away from the left, the left pretty much disowned me. Well, you talk about personal. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's become personal in, in some respects. I've had... Um, a uh, woman uh, I've known since we were seven years old, went to grade school all the way through college together, uh, outright called me a white supremacist on Twitter. Uh, I've gotten text messages before from friends like, do you really believe what you tweet? It's awful. You're a Nazi. Uh, I've had family members who have disowned me. But um, love a country. And, and I, have, I have two young sons. I, I'm, I'm not thinking about myself. You know, I'm going to be okay. I'm thinking about my seven and nine-year-old boys and the world that they're growing up in. And I see them going off to summer camp and wearing masks and like, this is no way to live. So I am going to use whatever ability I have. And if that's brutal, honest truth, if it offends people, then good. The more offensive, the better. I hate no one. There's not a bigoted bone in my body, but I'm going to speak truth. I'm not going to gaslight communities. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. The greatest problem in the black community is absentee fatherism. That is it. Hands down, that is the biggest problem. And if that makes me a white privilege, this or that, or a racist, you can call me whatever you want. But I'm going to use my platform and I'm going to use my voice to call it as I see it. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't pretend to have all the answers. But self-censoring? Look, I understand we have jobs and we have things to live for. I mean, that's kind of the sick humor of the right is like, we can't be out protesting 60 nights. We got to wake up and go to work. But we have to use our voice. This is a, at, the, at this point in the war, in the culture war, it's a digital battlefield. Now it is transcending that battlefield and it is getting hot in the streets. And I fear it's going to get even hotter. But we have to be able to do that because... When you say some, I notice you want to talk about reaction on social media. The greatest reactions that I get are when you speak that truth that everybody's afraid to say. You come out and say that thing, and then all of a sudden it's like it opens up something, and someone's like, Yes, oh my God, I feel the same way, but I'm afraid to say it. That's what we need more of because that's how you inspire other people to do the same. And let me tell you something we're winning hearts and minds. There, there are people out there who are looking to have their minds expanded and to, to walk away from liberalism, Democrats. There are reasonable, honest-to-goodness Democrats out there who are looking at Antifa, who are looking at BLM, who are looking at socialism, this Trojan horse of socialism that has been wheeled through the gates, and they're going, I didn't sign up for this. I just like unions. My dad was a union guy. Like, well, I, that's what I want. Why am I? I'm not subscribing to this ideology. So walk away from it, and it takes people you know, willing to, you know, I'm not saying I'm being brave or anything. I don't consider it, but just willing to speak truth regardless of the consequences. And if there are consequences, so be it. Uh, maybe I've just reached a point in my life where I no longer care. Maybe I'm just like a, like a grumpy old man. I don't know, but I have a, a lot to say and I'm, I'm just not going to be quiet about it. How do you think we come back from the liberalization of the left, uh, the media? I mean, I, I was not as in tune to the bias of media, maybe it was never that bad, or, or maybe I was just a lefty, so it was kind of, you know, perpetuating my ideology, and I, and I didn't really notice it. But since I've come to the center and to the right, I can't even watch CNN anymore, MSNBC. I mean, it's all orange man bad, and I have a hard time believing that any reasonable person can look at this type of news and think it's it's unbiased and. It seems like we've got so far left. I, I wonder what your thoughts are. I mean, we've got one, maybe two, Fox and OAN or what? Um, yeah. Um, I don't know of anybody else that's doing objective reporting or conservative reporting in, in the news. And I wonder what your thoughts are. Um, can we get it back? Can we get a little bit more centrist or objectivism as far as the media goes? Not from the mainstream media. Uh, we're not going to change the mainstream media. And you mentioned Fox and even Fox. I mean, they're running Biden ads left and right. And I, look, it's a numbers game. You know, if Biden's willing to spend the money on Fox. They're going to put out whatever uh, is paying the bills. How we combat the mainstream media is by doing exactly what you and I are doing. Citizens, ordinary folks who have something to say, 
taking to the airwaves, taking to social media, creating a platform. Look, podcasting in 2020 is what a blog was in 2005. It's easy. Anyone can do it. That's why you see a rise in podcasts. YouTube, these ordinary folks who have something to say. And these are alternative sources of information. I, I spend just as much time, if not more time, on YouTube, on you know, InfoWars and things like that. And you can say what you want about InfoWars, but you're getting news and you're getting information. You're getting stories there that they won't touch in the mainstream media. They're talking about Brunel Trammell, the black Trump supporter who was murdered in Wisconsin. Mainstream media has been dead silent about him. You're hearing about the young mother who was shot and killed in Indianapolis for saying all lives matter, shot and killed by Black Lives Matter. You're not hearing anything about, about that in the mainstream media. Uh, talking about George Floyd, not necessarily telling the BLM line about that, going like, hey, wait a minute, let's look at the body cam footage. Let's try to look at it objectively. You're not getting that from the mainstream. So if we just turn it off, you're not going to change it. Just turn it off. Look, it's, it's, they, we say it's a numbers game. If we turn it off and nobody's watching it, they're going to fall apart. And, you know, people tune into shows like yours, shows like mine, where we're presenting alternative viewpoints, talking about things that you're not going to hear about on the news. And, and you make up your opinion that way. You think we've reached a new normal, for lack of a better term? I hate that term because I think it, it promotes the idea that it, everything's changed from here on out. I don't believe that that's true. It, although it's hard for me to envision getting past riots in the streets. Uh, I said, you know, after Trump was elected, that it was a good thing he was elected because if there was some some question of whether or not the that the conservatives had won or Republicans had won or not, that the right would take to the streets and their guns, and you, you would not want to see that day. Now we're seeing the left riding, you know, these false narratives. I never took. I never really did the research on Colin Kaepernick and why he was kneeling or what Black Lives Matter represented. So, you know, months or years went on and then I'm like, okay, so what is this guy all about? All right, police brutality. Hang on a second. What are the stats? Well, the stats say that it's bullshit. Police are not mm -hmm. hunting black people. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So Colin Kaepernick started a movement and, and a protest on one knee based on a lie. Okay, I get it now. Now, I'm, I feel sorry for the people out there that haven't done the research that are still buying into this systematic oppression. There's the, systemic, I don't need to tell you this, systemic means throughout the whole body. It's not just like a local infection to your fingertip. It, it, systemic means everything. So mm -hmm. and we got Justin Trudeau in Canada saying the RCMP, oh, our, awesome. federal, our federal uh, police force is systemic from the bottom to the top. That yeah. every system, every school, every judge, every court, this idea, this is coming from the top leader. Now, talk about a cuck and not the brightest guy uh, ever to, to take politics, although he was bright enough to put really clever people around him to get him elected. But he, he's running on his father's name, obviously. But I just, it, it's so frustrating to see this new age where if Trump wins again, what, are riots going to become normal? Are we going to have to watch Oregon, Chicago, Texas, Seattle all burn to the ground because Trump won a second term? Like, it, it makes me worried that you talk about normalizing perversion. This is the perversion of the worst kind that you can take to the streets and burn businesses down, kill people. And, you know, George Floyd, now that we've seen the body cam, like I saw the transcript and before I'm like, Geez, this sounds like the cop was on his game, you know, and the guy was obviously high as a kite. He was, he said he couldn't breathe four times before he ended up on the ground. And he asked them, <clears throat> he asked the cops to put him on the ground. And, you know, I, I just, I, I'm losing hope, Eric. I'm losing hope that we could ever recover from this. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things about being a truth sayer is telling people, what they need to hear when it may be what they don't want to hear. Do you have cause for concern? Is there a legitimate reason to worry? Yes, there is. If Trump wins, and I, I believe he will, if he wins, there will be massive unrest in this country. The left has already shown us their hand. They show what they're willing to do. Are citizen patriots going to have to take their ARs and AKs and go out and defend their businesses and their neighborhoods? Quite possibly, yes. Is this going to be something where military is going to get involved? Look, the Democrats right now, and this is true, they're wargaming possible scenarios where Trump loses and refuses to concede the election. Mm -hmm. They are doing that. 
there is talk the there. Yeah. Oh yeah, and they're they're modeling scenarios where the West Coast secedes from the Union. We are on the verge of a civil war in this country that is not Infowars, Alex Jones, Black no. Ops kind of thing. That is God's honest truth. That's where we are. And to think it's been coming for the last four years, you haven't been paying attention for the last 30 years. The political divisions really began in the 1990s, really began, uh, if you want to take it a little bit sooner in time, probably around the Clinton impeachment. We never recovered from the Clinton impeachment because then we went into Bush. Remember how divided things were then? Remember how vilified you were if you were a Bush supporter? You remember that? And then uh, if you didn't vote for Obama, you were a racist. Um, and then, you know, this has been coming for a long time. Tea Party movement, we actually have Michael Johns coming on my show tomorrow. Uh, the Tea Party movement coming in the United States uh, as a reaction to that and, and sort of rising up uh, against the presidency of Obama. So this has been coming for a long time. We just always kept it clean. The gloves are off. The Democrats, the globalists, um, and I really can't just say the Democrats. I really say the globalists because I blame George W. Bush just as much as I blame Clinton or Obama for the problems, and certainly Bush Sr. for the problems that we've seen in the United States and, and in the world. So uh, this is really a cultural reckoning, and, and it's very uh, it's unnerving, and it's sad to watch, but it's reality. And if we conservatives just sit back on election night and in the days and weeks to follow and just go, oh, dear, they're burning our businesses down, uh, you may have to, you know, lace up and, and go defend what's yours. Um, we may come to that because, uh, ultimately, you know, you can't call the police cause we know they won't come. They can't, um, you're going to be on your own. So I think it's important to be community minded, you know, know who your neighbors are, know who your friends are, know your entrance and exit points in your neighborhood and just, you know, be ready. But uh, yeah, BLM, Antifa, if Trump wins, they're going to take to the streets. And hopefully, and, and I'm sure, look, if, if, if I'm a random guy and I could sit here and say it on your show, then certainly they know this in Washington, D.C., and I hope that they have measures in place and governors have the National Guard ready to go. We know it's going to be, it's going to be a bad night because regardless of what happens, you're going to have 50% of this country who's pissed. Now, if Trump, God forbid, Trump loses, are conservatives going to take to the streets? I don't think we would. But I don't think Trump's going to concede the election, which in case uh, that happens, then I think the left is going to take to the streets. Mm. Yeah, uh, I look forward to and actually fear the mobilization of the right, because I'm not sure that they'd be so understanding. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but may maybe that uh, is a bad analogy, because I mean, anytime before uh, George Floyd riots hit, the uh, right was mobilizing to you know, protest the end of the lockdowns and mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they're thousands strong, all loaded and carrying openly, no trouble. And Peaceful. Like, you know, the Antifa doesn't ever, you never see the right showing up to an Antifa protest. We should, protest. we should. Yeah, well, maybe, but it, it, it's the, the left, obviously, you know, we saw it with Gavin McInnes, the shit that got caused after his stupid little speech at the, mm -hmm. at the Republican club. And then Antifa went around the barricades and actually ambush these guys and four guys, four proud boys are actually doing hard times. Now the, the, la the Antifa guys didn't want to press charges. It was the DNC and the, you know, the Blasio or wh whoever the controls in, in New York city. But, and, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm fond of conspiracy theorists, but I don't, I don't put much faith in them. But mm -hmm. you mentioned Alex Jones, the, the number of times that he said something completely insane and turned out to be true it is like he was talking about Pedo Island. He's been talking about Pedo Island. Eight years decades. ago. Yeah, yeah. He's been talking yeah. about that forever. And this idea that, um, uh, you know, the can, uh, I, I wonder how things evolve past the point, like you talk about taking to the streets, well, that's maybe not likely to happen. but. Um, you know, I'm losing hope that we can ever get back to a place of normalcy. And uh, I don't know, maybe that maybe that's just on me. Well, we have a couple of options, um, none of which is easy. The first option is we fight. Uh, the second option is that we come to some sort of compromise. And we say, okay, West Coast United States, if you want to secede and be your own country, be my guest. 
neither one's good, but I don't think we can occupy the same space anymore. We hate each other. We do. We half half of America it really hates the other half. Hmm. And that's a problem. This whole COVID and George Floyd, you know, I I never bought into this. I think it it hit home. I spent a couple of days in the bush and the beach there this week. And I've really kind of tried on this idea that these riots have been stoked. The fans have been flamed. The, the flames have been fanned by media. And yeah. I'm not sure that there was a master game plan in, in place where they said, Oh, okay, let's, you know, the next unjustified killing will, will give us an excuse to riot or COVID. So now we've had a couple of things and now I'm, I'm actually considering, is this all a play against Trump? I yes. mean, COVID, the shutting down of the economy, the whole China conspiracy. Oh yeah. If we throw it like in the beginning days, I'm like, Oh, this is, this is right up Trump's alley because he's just standing in the box at batting practice. He's smoking them out of the park. Now the riots, you know, I, I, when they occupied Seattle, I'm like, roll the tanks. What, roll the tanks. What's the problem? I don't get the whole, I didn't understand completely the state sovereignty issues, you know, and that you can't just because, but I look at it this way. I go, listen, if the mayor first, the guy's closest to the problem, the mayor, if you don't fix the problem, okay, then the governor. Okay. If they, now if they don't fix the problem, if you've got occupied land inside of your country, you need to roll the tanks and flatten them. Yes. We saw how easily they came down. And my MAGA guys on, on Twitter were like, hang on a second. This is the master plan. Trump can't roll the tanks because if he did, it's anar like it's tyranny. You're forcing the, st the feds onto the states. Mm -hmm. And I, re I didn't really get that. And then they're like, oh, no. He's letting the left burn down so that when it gets to a point where there's no other recourse, Trump will come in. But I just I wonder what your thoughts are, this whole rioting combined with the COVID and I'm sitting there going, geez, is this, is the left that masterful at a game plan that this is actually, they, they're using current events to dethrone Trump? Is that all they've got? Well, it's not just the left. It's the deep state. It's the globalists. It's Soros. It's big money. This has been going on for a long time. Their first effort was Russiagate that fell apart. Mueller fell, fell apart. The impeachment fell apart. This is just a continuation of what they've been doing for the last four years. Is COVID a real virus? Yes. Does it have an 80% asymptomatic rate? Yes. The 99% of people who get it recover just fine? Yes. Is it being blown up in order to destroy Donald Trump by the left and the media? Absolutely. Was it brought here intentionally? Possibly. I don't think we can count that out. And the riots, were the riots planned? Were the riots uh, seizing on an opportunity? Yeah, that's been in the works for a long time. Follow the money. We know what's happening. Look, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery happened right in the middle of the lockdown. You didn't see riots after that. It was for some reason, this one incident, it, these are not organic riots. This is BLM money. This is Soros money. These are people being driven in. Look at the arrests. Look at where these people are from. If there's a protest or a riot in Minneapolis, why are 75% of them coming from Wisconsin and surrounding states? They're being bussed in. They are brought there. This is we're witnessing an insurrection, and yeah, should tanks be rolling through? Maybe not, but what about a thousand bikers for Trump or a thousand three percenters? These guys are pussies. These guys are are, are weak. Look at the look at the mug shots. These guys you get scary. get to get to the heart get to the heart of who these people are. These people are outcasts. These people are unattractive. They're not physically fit. They have no job prospects. These are losers. These are, these are textbook losers, the people that your parents warn you about becoming when you don't get good grades in school. You want to grow up and be like that? That's exactly who they are. And they've somehow found their calling. These are angry young white guys. That's who they are. And they're you know, pretending to speak on behalf of everybody. But if you follow history, if you watch what they're doing, my God, does it mirror the rise of Nazism? We're kind of like Germany 1929. I mean, you see it, the Nazi, the National Socialist Party was a ground up movement. That wasn't just a political party that formed in government. That was a, a grassroots movement that gained momentum. The reason the Democrats won't condemn them, the reason they're denying their existence and saying, oh, they're not riots, they're peaceful protesters, because they like what they're doing. They like what they're doing. They're there. They're, they're the frontline soldiers for the Democrat Party. 
That's why what's her face walked out of the hearing the other day when Ted Cruz was, was calling her out for not condemning them. They support them. And I, uh, that's why the, the liberal mayors are doing nothing. That's why during the lockdowns, when we had to lock down and destroy our businesses and uproot our lives because of this goddamn Chinese flu, and then all of a sudden, rioting comes and like, oh, well, that's a bigger health crisis than COVID. So we're going to let 10,000 people assemble, but you can't go to church. That blew the doors off the operation right there. We're all wide awake. And we, I want to say we're not going to stand for it. But then again, I have to question my words because are we? I mean, we're pretty damn compliant. I mean, our forefathers went to war on a 3% tax on sugar and stamps. They, oh, yeah. these, these colonists, these farmers took up arms against the greatest political and military power of the day, the British Empire, over a 3% tax on sugar and stamps. And here we are watching our rights be trampled upon, the rule of law no longer existing, now it's mob rule, and we're still compliant. And I think like, we really have a strong sense of consequences. I mean, that's the thing. People have to be willing to put it on the line. You know, freedom isn't free, man. And maintaining a constitutional republic is not a spectator sport. You may have to get your hands dirty. Appreciate your time, brother. Just on the way out, what do you think some lessons that the open-minded are most likely to learn out of COVID, out of uh, George Floyd riots? I mean, I don't know. I, I like to think I'm keeping my mind open as far as objectivity goes because I've changed my tune. I'm not 24 anymore. I don't believe the things I used to believe. I think my positions are more cemented now, but I'm still fluid. on. I think I mentioned capital punishment. Sure. I'm still fluid on a couple. Like I, I, I come from the, uh, the standpoint of like, I can be sold. Here's what I believe. I'm semi cemented in my position, but if you can convince me, convince me. Have a conversation. Mm -hmm. What do you think, you know, the moderate middle, the ones that, you know, aren't ideologically possessed either on the left or the right? And I, I find it very interesting now that the liberals are trying to sell that this is white supremacy. The, the, these Antifa riots are all white supremacist agitators. I'm like, mm -hmm. there's, there's 45 white supremacists in, in in North America, let's say, you can yeah. put them all in an average Starbucks. A lot more Antifa out there than there are white supremacists, I think, right now. But I think it's interesting that all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting these posts. Like, I think it's imaginary. I, I don't think that all, like, how many people are truly walking around that weren't born 100 years ago going, oh, yeah, kill them, black people. You know, it just doesn't happen. But I wonder, doesn't exist. Yeah, I wonder what your thoughts are on, on what the lesson for us to learn is coming out of this for any of us that are open enough to stay objective enough to go, Oh, well, what do you mean? That's all bullshit. <laughs> I didn't know that. One lesson you can learn coming out of COVID, the riots, everything going on is your government is not your friend. They're not there to help you. They're not going to save you. And they're it not there to solve your problems. You need to take an active role in saving your own life. Personal you need to be armed. You need to have, you know, be, one thing about the lockdown, and, you know, we're all a little guilty of this, um, when the shit hit the fan and all of a sudden um, you know, your, your business may close, you, you, you can't get the things that you, you can, um, you know, we all turn to the government, you know, paycheck protection, um, emergency, disaster loans. I mean, we all turn to the government. People were getting stimulus checks. Uh, even diehard conservatives, everyone would kind of put their beliefs on the shelf and went, like, to hell with my ideology. I need to feed my family. And I think we, and a lot of it is society to blame and just where we are, like the cost of living is way too high and we're all, we've become a nation of debt slaves. I think if one thing positive comes out of it financially, we're going to be a lot more forward thinking and plan a lot better. So I think that's part of your survival kit is financial planning. You know, when times get better and you're back to work and you're making money, like, do you really need to go out for dinner that night? Do you really need to go buy this thing? You, like, think about your expenditures, save your money. And I think, especially for young people um, who were never good at saving, I mean, I'm an older millennial and I'm you know, 38, almost 39. And I think about, like, you know, what my dad tells me. And, like, I should have been saving money or should have been doing this. And I, I didn't listen because my life is too expensive. I got kids in private school, student loans, mortgage, car payments. So I think we need to figure out how to adjust. We need to be better financially. 
But we need to understand that when things happen, and it's not a hypothetical when, it's, we know that this is real, we need to be ready and willing to protect ourselves. So don't be a sitting duck, don't rely on the government, protect yourself, be smart. Because uh, in the end, you know, they like to say on TV, we're all in this together, but we're not. Oh, uh, you may be on your own. Yeah. Who are you listening to for uh, comedy or who do you get in your news from? Who are you chummy with these days? Who's in your tight circle? Well, okay, for, for news, um, I am a big fan of Jeff Dornick, who's one of my colleagues over at Freedom First Network. We love uh, being over there. We moved over from New Right Network, which was great, gave us our start. So check him out. Um, Mike Yoder, he's got a great show with NRN. He's a great young lawyer. He's got a lot of things co- going on. A uh, big fan of his. On the political stage, uh, my good friend D.B. Fugate is running for Congress here in Florida's 23rd Congressional District, looking to unseat Debbie Wasserman Schultz. So nice. early voting starts on Sunday. Uh, go vote. You have to write him in for whatever reason. He's not on the ballot. You have to write him in. But if he gets enough on the ballot, he wins the primary. It's going to be D.B. Fugate and Debbie Wasserman Schultz in the general. And I think he's going to win. As far as uh, you know, getting my information, I- I'm an InfoWars guy. I mean, I... Say what you will about Alex Jones. I'm a huge fan. I watch oh, he's him. He's wildly I, entertaining. Love Alex I, Jones. His, his episode with Joe Rogan was hysterical. One of the best shows Joe's yeah. ever done. Yeah. And he, he's another one. He's another one. Joe Rogan, uh, he's not necessarily a conservative. He's kind of a traditional libertarian. I love Joe Rogan. And the voice of this country right now, if I got to take my hat off to one guy in the mainstream media, it's Tucker Carlson. If you watch one person on mainstream TV, if you watch one hour of TV a day, and that's really all about I do when it comes to TV, it's from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's Tucker Carlson. Just listen to his intro. He is speaking truth every night, and we just need more people like him. And he is, uh, he is by far, for me, and I watch a lot of broadcasters, and as a broadcaster, you know, former radio guy and whatnot, I'm the worst critic, and he technically is like he stumbled on a word the other day i tweeted it out i'm like tucker stumbled on a word write it down like he He's doesn't human, make a mistake God. he never makes a mistake the guy is flawless He's and amazing. i like his take and i like when he rips on trump because you got conservatives have lots of options to rip on trump and it's how the left does oh no we're fine we're fine you know justin trudeau inappropriate t- touches someone or joe biden oh no it's fine it's fine it's fine what happened to me uh, you know, hashtag me too. So uh, I agree with you there. Uh, as far as talent goes, what do you got coming up, brother? Where can we see you? What guests you're working on? You got, you got another book in you or what? Oh, so the book. Okay. So I wrote uh, a couple years ago, I wrote a legal thriller entitled the victim. It's no longer in print. I think there's a copy on Amazon for a thousand and two dollars. I don't see any of that money. I'm like, my contract with the publishers up. Uh, will I ever get back to it? I think about it every now and then. And I talk to a lot of writers. I have a lot of authors on the show. And I had a a couple of months ago, I had Ava Armstrong on, who's written like 20 books. And I don't know how she has it in her. She cranks them out all the time. Uh, David Burke is a great writer I've had on. I've had a lot of Cat Turd, our friend Cat Turd. He writes books. He's an amazing writer. So um, I'd love to, maybe one day, I don't know. As far as the show goes, we have a show tomorrow streaming at 12 noon. And then obviously right afterwards, we're on all the podcast formats, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Tomorrow we have Michael Johns, founder of the Tea Party, coming on. Uh, This month, we're also going to have a couple congressional candidates coming on. And capping off the month on the 29th, a woman I've been looking to talk to for a long time, Miss Juanita Broderick, is coming on. She's got a lot to say about the revelations of Bill Clinton. Now, Now, we call them revelations, but truth be told, she's known what an animal he's been uh, for 40 years. Let me tell you something. And, and one thing about Juanita, the Clintons kill people. The Clintons have had many people killed. And the fact that Juanita can still have the platform she's had, she walked away from everything relatively unscathed. And she's been threatened by Hillary. And she's been through that. And so we're going to get into that. The 29th of August, 12 noon, tune in, because she's going to talk about the good old boy network from the Arkansas days. Uh, and how Bill Clinton basically had the state troopers as his own personal Gestapo. Um, they are some bad folks, guys. The Clinton family is about as evil as it comes. And uh, God bless Juanita for you know, being safe and being able to emerge from that and be a voice. And even many, many don't listen to her. She's been screaming to high heaven for the last 40 years what an animal this guy is. And uh, even despite Me Too, which I think has kind of died away, uh, people still silence her. So we're looking forward to having her on. 
Eric Matheny, I love you, brother. I'm proud of you. Keep it up. Thank you. Stay strong. Stay golden. And uh, I hope to touch you up soon. Uh, we'll get an update from you maybe in a couple months. But uh, I'm, I'm a fan of your podcast now, brother. Uh, thanks for the follow. That's the only reason I got you on the show is because I was, <laughs> I tweeted the other day, who do I got to fuck to get a follow from Cat Turd? <laughs> <laughs> Cat Turd, he, he ignored me. That's fine. I'm working on him, though. Hey, he was a good interview, though. And I love that, that Southern drawl. There's something oh, yeah. about that, man. He's the real deal. He, he's, he's a Florida panhandle guy. He's, he's the real deal. He's smart. boy. Keep it up, brother. I appreciate the time, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Talk soon, bro. Take care. Stop recording. And all good? Yeah, we're all good. Thank you, sir. We'll talk soon. We'll have you on one of these days. Awesome. I appreciate that. Take Peace, care. Bro. Have a nice day. All right. You too.